<laughs> I hope you sell like lemonade on a hot day. We want the easy fix. Again, that monkey braid, we like reward. Even if it's 600, I don't care. I want you to be happy and I want you to, to be successful. And if I needed more words to tell the story, then you're going to get some extra. Every single day. <laughs> Every single day, I wonder why somebody has paid me some money to do something. Hey guys, so in just a second, I'm going to share with you an interview I just had with a copywriter who was able to quit their job, move to Mexico, and make between 10 and 20,000 US dollars every month, some months even more. His name is Kerry, and the purpose of me having him on the channel was to shed some light on what can be possible if you take freelancing and specifically copywriting very seriously. So I hope you enjoyed this interview, and I hope it's inspiring. All right, guys. So um, today we actually have a, a pretty special guest on the channel, um, kind of an old friend, Carrie Morrison. So Carrie and I, we've actually never met, but we met through the interview process years ago when I was, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of applying slash being approached to work for a small startup in Canada. And since we then, should have hired you. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, we'll get into that in a bit. It was a funny situation, <laughs> but yeah, Kerry actually made the switch to doing freelancing. He he left Canada, moved to like a tropical paradise. Just a really cool guy. So Kerry, thank you so much for agreeing to meet and chat with me today. But um, of course, but can you can you maybe take a minute to just kind of give us your background from your perspective? Because I might have missed a couple things. <laughs> well, as you can tell from the gray hair, I've been doing this a while, so yeah, it's hard to cover uh, to cover everything. Uh, yeah, I mean, the short version is that I spent uh, a decade working in advertising, you know, uh, the digital side, but for the for the old school large agency uh, companies, mm -hmm. uh, Gray, TBWA, uh, BBDO, that kind of thing. And then, uh, actually, when I moved to Toronto, I transitioned into running companies, uh, building products, uh, you know, helping startups, uh, a lot more in that world. So I sort of had a, the first half of my career learning to tell stories, and then the second half of my career learning how to build products, and now sort of help both of those sides with whatever they need, m mostly on the copywriting side. Um, which is what I tell everybody that I do, but I, I still can't help but bring up all the old, uh, uh, or, or bring up a bunch of the old knowledge to help folks across the board. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So yeah. just to give some context, I met Kerry, who was the VP of marketing at, um, a tech startup, right? So he, he kind of did everything marketing at that organization and now he's freelancing. So like Harry, you, you mentioned a lot of stuff. Like, how, how did you make the switch, and you know what kind of prompted you to make the switch? So, uh, look, uh, the way that I would put this to my friends is that I'm not very smart. <laughs> uh, you know, I I spent a lot of years working for a lot of people and for a lot of clients on a lot of projects, and. I was never one of those people that believed they had a a skill. You know, like I wasn't a designer. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't a developer. I didn't have, you know, a thing that I did. So I really migrated to being, a, you know, a leader and a manager of people. Uh, certainly I did some sales, which I've always sort of rebelled against. And so they rebelled against saying that I uh, uh, like doing. But I never really had a thing. Mm -hmm. And and you know, look, I, I by all measure, I had a, a pretty good uh, career and, and enjoyed a lot of it. But after that startup that that we talked about bringing you into, uh, and the pandemic, you know, sort of fit into that as well. I just I, I really hit a wall, and and took some time to examine, you know, the things that were bringing me some bringing me joy more than anything. Yeah, I feel like Friend a lot of, of people, a lot of people get into that situation where they're kind of starting to feel like they're not enjoying it as much as they used to, but they never do what you just did and examine it and kind of reflect on it. Yeah. I mean, look, uh, this is some, some people that I listened to were very instrumental in this, uh, you know, sitting around, I was stuck in um, Malta of all places during the lockdown. Uh, Terrible place to get stuck. <laughs> oh, well, listen, uh, people have asked me since what Malta is like, and I have no idea. 
because Malta had very strict lockdown. So we actually oh, weren't really? allowed to leave the house for an hour a week to go get groceries. Wow. Um, I was with some friends. Yeah. So we, we were remote I and mean, we had a nice setup, uh, with some, some dear friends of mine, but uh, very locked down, very remote, very on our own. And, you know, I was reading a lot and I was talking to people online and, and I had the opportunity to help, you know, some people were doing some things, building some things. And I said, oh, look, I, let me let me help you with some messaging there. Let me uh, uh, try and give you an outline of some things I think you should do. And there's actually a friend of mine that said, hey, man, you know, look, I, I really love this stuff. That you said, I mean, you're a fantastic writer. And I said, nah, I, you know, I don't. Uh, it was nah. just like by I, chance I, that that happened? Yeah, really. Lockdown, you just uh, really? Wow. I mean, no. So what, what, what happens is I have spent in almost any job I've ever had. I've written things. I mean, obviously, I've written proposals, I've written decks, I've written presentations. But even, you know, I remember uh, in, in one of my early jobs, we had a, a, a commercial, like a physical TV commercial we were doing. Um, and the script wasn't quite quite there. And we all kind of knew it. And, and my creative director at the time, not out of uh, trust and belief, I would say, but more out of necessity, basically said, hey, can you just look at it, do anything you can do to make it better. And I, I ended up writing, a, a, you know, a bit of that script. And and I'm not saying it was a masterpiece, and it was a long time ago, but th- everybody looked at it, well, yeah, that's better, right? Uh, so over the years, I've, I've had people say, look, that thing you wrote was really lovely. Hey, that thing you wrote made it, finally made the thing make sense. But I always looked at it like a, you know, that was in a moment of desperation, if a real writer had to come in there, they would have done it 10 times better. And bit of imposter. You know, I, there. I, yeah, very much so. Very, very much so. And I, I never believed that that was something that I was good at. I have no background in that. I didn't go to university. You know, I was a tech guy who grew up in, in uh, you know, in the digital side of things. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I had a, a friend again during the pandemic finally say, look, you're an idiot. Like every time you write something, it's, it's, I love it go and do some writing. And I'm not talking like, I'm not going to write a novel. I don't have a screenplay in me or anything like that. But I know the world of marketing and technology so well after 20 plus years that I seem to be able to tell those stories in a that, way that, that people respond to. That's amazing. And it's so it's so interesting hearing it come from you because I feel like a lot of people had I, I had that when I started too. like I felt like I knew sales really well and I was coming into copywriting and, you know, people were using what I was writing and saying it was really good. But I'm looking at it like, oh, but, you know, I'm not a pro copywriter. You know, there's probably people who would crush this. And, you know, a thing I think about a lot is how do you convince more people who have some sort of a focused area of expertise like you? You had a whole successful career in marketing. Obviously, you would know how to write stuff for marketers or marketing and to help with marketing. But in your in our heads, we, we think like, oh, I'm not a writer. I haven't labeled myself as a writer. So, you know, this isn't something I should do. Like, how did you overcome that? Did it just take time? Or once the money started flowing in, you're like, oh, yeah, I am a copywriter. Or, you know, what happened to switch the mindset? Or do you still feel you're not like a legit writer? Every single day. <laughs> Every single day, I wonder why somebody has paid me some money to do something. <laughs> and every time I finish a project and I send it off, I'm, I think, my God, you know, what an abject failure. What a piece. Can I swear here? Sure. What a piece of shit. <laughs> uh, I, I really do. I really do. Um, well, I guess I guess that kind of also keeps you on your toes, right? Versus getting complacent. I, I think and, so. Yeah. I think so. Uh, it's I actually just it was suggested to me in my in my YouTube feed the other day, but I came across a uh, a video of a talk that my old business partner in Toronto and I gave at some startup thing in the city, and it was called "Why We Hate Everything We've Ever Done." <laughs> and, and what, what, what was there? What was the point of that speech? Well, it's not it's not the most polished piece because I'm sure we put it together about 20 minutes before we went up there. But the, I've always had, and it fits into that imposter syndrome a little bit, but I've always had this belief that, you know, we, we can't aim for perfect, right? Perfect is the enemy of good. All of that stuff I very much believe in. But if you don't, if you don't feel like you've left a little something on the table, 
If you don't feel like, oh, I could have just made it, you know, 10% better or 20% better. If you don't have that every single time, I, I don't know how you, you keep going. I don't know how you keep trying to be better. I don't know how you keep yourself honest and, and don't get complacent and, and let the ego run wild, which is yeah. the enemy of all good work. Yeah. Right. You know, I, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit, but I got really, really busy. Uh, when I, when I really focused on saying I was a writer, I got really busy and I, and I, within about six months, I could feel the, that ego and that animosity, you know, um, creeping in when nine out of 10 said, this is great. And the one, one person said it wasn't, I was like, what do you know? What do they know? Yeah. Oh man. Right? Yeah. And, and that's, that's not, that doesn't work. So I, I, I would like to have less anxiety about it because I think that's probably healthier. Uh, and I'm not some tortured, you know, artist by any stretch of imagination, but I'd like to have less anxiety about it. But when I really sit back and reflect on it, I think it's a good thing. I think it's okay to always yeah. want it to be a little more and always want it to be a little better. And I'm absolutely the writer yeah. who's up to the second I hit send. I'm like, oh, God, I'm going to tweak that. I'm going to change that word. Oh, I'm going to fix that. So, you, you know, you have to get it out there, obviously, to, to hit deadlines and to keep people happy. But uh, yeah, I, every single day, I, I don't. I feel like I don't know what I'm doing. Every. You know, I, I feel like that just comes with the territory, especially with something like copywriting, because you know, you're trying to get someone to do something a lot of the time. And we get fed so much stuff on the internet nowadays that what gets people to take action changes like weekly or daily even. So if you're not thinking you can always improve as a writer, you're going to become a dinosaur and your copy is going to start to suck. And people are just going to be like, don't hire this old dude in Mexico anymore. He sucks. You know, like it's you're yeah, just gonna listen, get a bad rep. Don't get me started about the, the absolute sheer uh the volume of bullshit that exists out there about copywriting right every single day especially on the steaming uh, pile of hot garbage that twitter's become uh <laughs> there's a tweet of hey you know you're gonna make ten thousand dollars your first month of copywriting copywriting so easy anybody can oh do it. dude i love uh, i love yeah. that you said that i love that you said i j i literally just released a video yesterday that's like maybe a little clickbait it's called like the one hundred thousand dollar copywriting formula oh but the, i just the, saw it. I, thought, I saw the thumbnail and the whole premise is you can make a hundred grand but i think to get there most people will need to do two hours of practice a day for three years <laughs> and I, I lose I a lot of people you. i literally start the video by saying if you can't finish this video from start to finish there's a high probability you won't be successful doing what i'm about to tell you and then i kind of hit them with this it might take three years of you doing this every day like learning an instrument right like you can't expect to go to be, yeah. like 100k as like what would be a side hustle for a lot of people like no one's going to just start copywriting totally fresh with their job on day one three years is a reasonable amount of time to make 100k with a new skill set right so i love i love that you said that because i see so many videos and tweets and this it's like start today within six months you could be earning six figures doing what like like they don't like they just throw these numbers but they they like mislead people by you know, hiding the fact that with that, you have to be really good at sales to find clients. You have to know how to manage difficult clients because you're not making 100K a month banging out $20 projects. So these are going to be big, complicated, a lot of stakeholders. It gets complicated. And yeah, I, I love that you said that because I am in the YouTube copywriting game and there's this like fine balance of luring people in with what they think they want which is the bull BS and then giving them what they need, which is kind of the content and then trying to find a way to convince them to stay when you're pointing out that what they actually need is not what they thought they wanted. And it's not this magical fairyland of money, just shooting at you from a money cannon every day. No. And look, I mean, your content is great at that in general. Uh, look, can, can, could most people become copywriters? Uh, or, or help people tell marketing and sales stories. Sure. I, again, I don't think I'm that smart. I'm pretty good at this. People have had some pretty insane success with the words that I've written. Not every, not every piece is, you know, Shakespeare. 
Um, and I'm and I'm sure not every project results in this huge massive ROI. It's kind of like a moving target yeah, sometimes. Course. Yeah, of course, right. Um, and and look, I'm not. Uh, you know, I, I'm I read voraciously, but I have no. I, I barely finished high school. Right? I was working. I took my first agency job at the week I turned eighteen. Um, I still, if you ask me what a verb or a noun or a pronoun is, I have to think about it. I'm the same. Right? I'm in the same boat, dude. Yeah. yeah. But, but I think the thing, there's sort of two halves to this. One is that I think lots of people could do this. I think there's a massive need out there for it. I think that even though I live inside of chat GPT for, for different things, uh, I, copywriters aren't going away. Human writers aren't going away. Not in our lifetime. Um, but the flip side is that, like you said, it's if you if you disappeared and did nothing all day every day for six months, you could probably start, you know, have the tools in order to get some clients or three years of part time. But I, also, the every and and look, what those guys are doing is good copyright, right? They're hooking, they're they're getting you in with the hook of easy money fast. It's a weak hook though, because then that it's it, so hard to course. deliver real content well, that course. delivers on that, right? Of course. Um, and I think the bigger thing for me is I, cause I always go look at a lot of, uh, almost all those things. I'm fascinated by, you know, courses and teaching and digital sales, of course. Um, I've yet to see a course that talks about the things that actually make copywriters successful. It has less to do as we, as we keep saying with great, you know, great words and great English. Most of my writings at a grade six level, grade seven level, when I check it in, uh, in the apps. <laughs> uh, on purpose. Um, Mark, copywriting is psychology. Copywriting is understanding your audience. Yeah, you know, copywriting is motivation. And I don't, I haven't seen anybody. You know, my, my hero in all things, and this is actually the thing that, that drove me into really wanting to work in in um, advertising, is David Ogilvy. Mm. Right. I, I saw this this thing and this uh, it wasn't the actual ad because the ads from the sixties I think, but in a in a marketing I think it was marketing mag, there was the old uh, David Ogilvy ad that for Mercedes Benz that says uh, at sixty miles an hour the only thing you'll hear is the clock. That's that's and a for good some ad. reason. Oh, it's the, arguably the best line ever written in in marketing because uh, it's so genius and. And I, I didn't know anything about marketing or copywriting at the time. And something about that just seemed so genius to me, so smart and so succinct. And then when I read the article and it talked about how he, he was the master of research and he found that little nugget in like page 467 of the user manual for the car. That basically some engineer had said, Hey, you know, the, the clock ticking noise might be too loud for you when you're driving because the car is so quiet or whatever it was. <laughs> but but it's perfect. It, it's perfect. It's perfect. It, it it's embodies perfect. what Benz is trying to do and what their buyers want. And people skip that so much yeah, nowadays. 100%. Everyone's looking 100%. for a formula. Like that's what I've noticed. Every everyone yeah. like I study my audience like like we're like bad to like a bad level. Like I'm I'm obsessed with trying to figure it out. Um, and everything that everyone's looking for is like a quick plug and play formula that is wash, rinse, and repeat. And that is just so stupid to me because, like you just said, copywriting is research and psychology and knowing your audience and understanding the product. Like there's no formula that can substitute you taking your time to do the legwork to figure all this out for every project. And of course, with experience, you just kind of absorb some of this and it becomes quick access. But uh, I I love that you said that. That's really, that's something I battle with all the time. It's like, how do you sway the pendulum on the internet in the direction that actually makes sense for a lot of people? We're we're not, my friend, we're not. (laughs) Uh, There's too many hucksters out there. And look, it's, if you go back to, you know, the, the psychology of motivation, you know, we, we intrinsically would love and seek out a silver bullet, right? We want the easy fix, you know, that, that human monkey brain wants to be lazy. You got to fight. So 
when we're told or we're presented with the dream that we can get out of our shitty day, day job that we have to go to an office across town and sit in traffic uh, every day to get to with this idea that you can live in Mexico with your laptop and write white words and make all the money in the world. Uh, I, I get why people are going to gravitate there. I understand completely the, the motivation and the dream. I get sucked into it, right? I am deep, deep. I've got actually gone backwards now in my personal projects. I'm going all deep into SEO. Really? Yeah, uh, which, is, which is something I did 10, probably almost 15 years ago. And uh, like I'm SEO getting sucked for in. your clients or? Uh, some SEO services for my clients, which is something that I'm going to launch sort of a standalone thing here soon. But even just some, I just like the, the, the science behind it. So I've, I've, I've launched four websites that nobody knows about that I'm not going to talk about that are, have nothing to do with things I'm interested in, just solely to see how much I can manipulate the search engine. I like that. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, 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 and sorry, inside of that, I'm getting sucked into, oh, well, I can make some really easy affiliate money or, oh, I could do some some other things because I come across all that content. Too. <laughs> and you have to remember, you have to step back a little bit. Again, I don't think we're going to we're going to change the minds of the Internet. W what I would really like to do, though, what I think maybe we should do this together. Uh, what I think would crush is here's your 365 day course on how to make one hundred dollars. From copywriting. No one's going to do that course. <laughs> we might have to. We, it's it, it has to be. Again, we'll go. We'll think about the words and the selling, but it has to be like the stop being a fucking idiot and fucking around and actually make a career out of this. Don't quit your job. Do this every morning for one hour, and after three months you'll make you know a hundred bucks. After six months you'll make a thousand bucks, and after a year you'll make ten thousand dollars. And literally every day, send an email that says, "Do these three things for the next hour." Do that's actually people. a great that's a great idea i just don't have faith in humanity that people will be, <laughs> people will be like screw this i'd rather go work minimum wage but that's the issue that see that's what i You're try to right. do in every video i try to dangle the carrot of making money and then plant the reality that it takes time but it's one of those things where like i, I made a video once <laughs> i got so much flack people ripped me for this but i thought of this idea i was like would you sit in a chair in a dark room doing nothing for seven days a week for five thousand dollars just pitch black 10 hours a day five thousand dollars a week to do nothing everyone instantly yes yes of course of course yeah oh my god people from overseas yeah that's like so much money where i'm from <laughs> and then i raised the question I'm like but like if you think about it from the perspective of you probably go insane you'll probably be depressed you probably have all this crazy thoughts going on. What if instead you just spent half of that time, let's say four hours per day, working on a skill like copywriting, and probably within a year or two years, you could get to $10,000 a week or a month or whatever. Like, Wouldn't that be more fulfilling than just sitting in a chair and wasting away? People got so pissed off because they're like, I thought you were going to give me the idea of how to sit in a chair and make $5,000 a week. I'm like... What? Like, <laughs> what did you think was going to happen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, so that, I, I that mean, that's like look, I, that that video jaded me so much. I I pumped it up. It's supposed to be motivating. Like people are like, yeah, you know, we're going to do this because I can't sit for an hour alone in my living room with no simulation without going crazy. You know what I mean? No, like, unless no, I'm like meditating when, intentionally. So imagine doing it for a week, forty hours a week. Everyone's like, I'm on board. I'm like. Your mind's going to fall apart. It's like solitary confinement. Uh, the two things come up for me. One is that uh, I'm pretty certain I saw a Mr. Beast video a while ago where he locked the guy in a room full of stuff, right? Pool table, a guitar, a TV, uh, you know, a bunch of things. And basically said every, every day or every week, we're going to remove one thing. And if for every week you last, you get 10 grand or whatever the number was or 100 grand. It was he crazy. didn't even make a week probably. No, I think he made three weeks. Wow. I think the guy made three weeks before he's like, I just miss people. I miss my girlfriend. I'm there's I have less stuff in here to do. There's no sound. Like you know what I mean? And I, the I think sound, the sound would drive room. me nuts. Like hearing my yeah. tinnitus from all the concerts I've been to, just getting louder yeah. and louder. No, no, no. But the other thing is that I think like if you look at Alex Hormozzi, 
you know, he, I mean, his success is so massive that I think it, it maybe clouds some of the vision, but his whole thing is you need two to three years to change your life. And if you're not willing to give a, a year, two years, three years to make the next 50 better, then what the fuck are you doing? You know, it's so and funny. People you bring... seem to be responding. You see, he does a good job at that. So I first heard that concept actually from a YouTuber called Ali Abdal. I don't know if you've ever heard mm-hmm. of him. He's yeah, not yeah. as big in the marketing and starting business. He's kind of more of a as like a productivity guy. But yeah. that concept is so true. And that's what I tried to use for that video on copywriting. Where it's like the formula is simple, really. If you can spend a period of, you know, two years, even one year, an extended period of time with that on your mind as your goal to do that, you can do it. And like almost every copywriting course video I put on on YouTube, the steps are simple. Like this recent one, it's like two hours a day, one hour, just write anything. I don't care what you write. Just start writing for an hour a day. 30 minutes, read read absolutely anything i do not care just start consuming stuff to kind of build your vocabulary and get your mind juices flowing and then the last 30 minutes is study copyright like how much simpler can that be you know what i mean and i i actually strongly believe if you do something that like a, a series of steps that simple for two years you could you could be a pretty solid writer but nobody does it you know no like, and look i i get it because the we, we, again, that monkey brain, we like reward, right? You yeah. need, I, I think if you could make somebody 10 bucks in their first week, you might have enough to help them. But there has to be something. Yeah. Right? It, it, yeah. Except for the people who, who you know, like Hormozzi talks about coming from having no money, right? Like having zero dollars, even his, uh, his wife, Layla. Like we ha- I had no money. I had nothing. So do you think I was going to go out there and hustle way more than everybody else? You damn right I was, right? Yeah. Um, but you're right. All all those guys start, have have been talking about that. Maybe there's a bit of a shift. Maybe there's enough people out there that would would be willing to get into that. Um, but you're right. It just it doesn't. It's it's not rocket science, and it just takes any of these things take dedication. Any of these things. Yeah. Like and whether to, it's reading or or practicing. Yeah, it, it drives me nuts because people have these barriers in their head. Like you started this interview by saying, I don't think I'm very smart. And I feel the same way. I think I'm an idiot. I don't have perfect grammar. I make mistakes. I don't always use commas and punctuation in the perfect place. Sometimes I use like stupid things like an EM dash just because that in my head it makes it feel like it works. And it's fine. But people like people who are like okay fine i will put in the work then they said to baron like oh okay i have to read the elements of style 500 times and and learn proper proper english to do this but have you ever seen a billboard that's like perfect english a billboard sorry you know some of them are written like they're texts you know like it's talking to people i i don't know anyways i'm just ranting now you're right you're right you're right you're right if you get look uh you know apples think different one of the most successful campaigns of all time brought that company back around. Think different isn't the right grammar. Think differently is the right grammar. Yeah. But think different works. I, I was just telling this uh, to a friend of mine yesterday because we're having a similar conversation. One of the best performing headlines that I've written in the last couple of months, get out of your cat, <laughs> was, was the worst English you could imagine, but it was the perfect encapsulation of what this brand was and what the result of, uh, you know, buying that product was. And I even said that it's a friend of mine's company, so I get a little bit more leeway, but I sent him the headline and he said, dude, this isn't English, (laughs) right? This is not, and I said, yeah, I know, but here's why. And just, let's just do a a test. And, And believe me, I, all my clients hear this way too often, test, 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 test. Yes. nothing i say is yeah. possible so you know what anyway that's another nugget everyone a lot of clients i find especially like m- maybe le- less experienced clients people who haven't done marketing for a while they expect to take one piece of copy and it totally changes their business yeah which is kind of rid- ridiculous but rarely yeah. happens rarely yeah. happens i mean we might get great sales off of something but we can always optimize we can always make it better and your audience uh, changes and- you know? Yeah, of course. 
of course. Yeah. But, but again, the, the point is that it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to work. Yeah. So, Kerry, I, I have a couple. We, we've been riffing, and I love it. This has been a great conversation. But I have some questions I want to ask that no I think question. people would be interested in. So you, mm-hmm. and it, guys, if you don't remember, Kerry was the VP of marketing at a company I was trying to get a job at. He's a pretty successful marketing guy. You switched to copywriting and freelancing, right? You sell on Fiverr through your own website. Like, where do you get clients from? Uh, I would say that 80 to 90% now come through referrals. Referrals. See, that's amazing. How, how did you get to that point? No idea. <laughs> Just doing good work, I guess? <laughs> no, I, listen, I, I, think I, um, I think I provide a good bit of service. You know, I talk... Um, I talk people through what we're doing. I try to make them feel comfortable. I make sure they're happy with, with the words that I write. I am, you know, getting pretty good performance out of most of the words. Um, but I also, again, because I have that background, almost every time when somebody says, hey, can you, uh, like I just had somebody yesterday, we're, we're trying to raise some money. Um, our pitch deck sucks. Can you, I was told by someone so that you wrote their pitch deck. Could you take a look at our pitch deck? And I can look at that and, and go, yeah, look, I get what you're doing. Have you thought about X, Y, and Z from the business side? Mm. Have we thought about, you know, how to do this and this from, you know, an opportunity side? And then I'll craft the story to fit that. So I think I can add mm. some more value. Okay. And, I, you know. I, no, go ahead. Sorry, I was just thinking with my mouth. No, I, <laughs> I just, uh, you know, I, I've happened to help some people raise a good bit of money. So there's a nice track record there. But I think when, when I can offer more, then, you know, I get this this thing where people will call and say, hey, I was talking to so-and-so and they were singing your praises. Mm-hmm. Hey, I know that you got, I know that you helped these guys. We're doing something similar. We're talking to the same people. Can you help us? Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that kind of comes I out did. of you, you kind of showing them where you can help. Like they don't know what they don't know. You're working on one thing and you're kind of, going a little wider in the in the company yeah you're working i think with. so i okay. think so and again if the if if i was doing that and the words didn't perform then it would probably not matter mm-hmm. because i can do that and and the other thing for me uh and i've always been a bit of a um i was gonna say a bit egotistical but i'm, I'm gonna use the word jerk about it is i will not tell you what you want to hear i don't care who you are I've had I feel CEOs like that's kind of good. No, no, listen, I, well, not a yes it's man. not always, it's not always good. I've lost jobs because of this. Uh, I've been fired from jobs because of this. Um, but I will not, uh, not speak my mind. And so if, when, when I get, and then this is, again, just happened a couple of days ago. Uh, hey, we're this company, we're doing this. We need you to do X. And I said, no, you don't. <laughs> And the guy was like, uh, what? I said, no, you don't need that. Here's why. Here's where you're at. Here's why that's not going to be effective. Here are the things you should do instead. If you want to go find somebody else other than me to go do those things, I would really encourage you to. And it'll save you money and it'll save you time. I like that. I mean, that that's a concept I've also kind of dabbled with where I come from a tech sales background. The customer doesn't know what they need. You know what they need. Otherwise, why would they hire you? So I'm of the mindset that, yeah, while you might have lost a couple projects or, you know, egotistical clients that didn't like to be told what direction to go, that's kind of where you bring in your value and probably why you get to charge what you charge. I mean, I would certainly hope so. I've just never, and you actually just hit the nail on the head. And I can think of my my very first job at uh, at Gray Advertising, big worldwide agency. Uh, We I think it was for a bank. I don't remember the client now. We had spent three months working on this campaign. I mean, just, you know, half the agency, uh, all TV and print and digital and all this stuff, crazy things, all of the research, the customer um, uh, research we had done, you know, focus groups, all this kind of stuff. And we, we pitched this final thing and the client went, yeah, you know what? I really like yellow and uh, pictures of cheerleaders. And the, and the account guy went, no problem. We'll change everything. And I remember the client walking out, my going, why did they just pay us all that money? Yeah, they could have done it themselves. Aren't, aren't we the people that know this? Yeah, yeah, but this is what the client wants. 
And I, that weak, just makes weak. zero, zero sense to me. And, you know, I get it that in some instances, you know, I've had clients that have come by. We, we did this thing for Hyundai a few years ago when I was in Toronto. And we were hired to do one thing. We did that thing, but we um, had come up with these visuals, these animated visuals for this uh, web product that they wanted to do. And one of my team members had said, God, this would make a really good commercial if we could do this and this and this. And so I said, well, just, you know, storyboard that up a little bit. And we did. And I went to the, to my Hyundai clients and I said, look, I know we don't do this kind of stuff for you, but we had this idea. We just wanted to give it to you. And we, I kind of pitched it to them and they went, yeah, that's great. Do it. And so not only did we have to go back and figure out how to do a TV spot, but we went back and we spent a lot of time and we spent a lot of their money getting this thing ready. And when we pitched it, the all the team that we usually worked with was like this is great this is amazing we were on a late on a on a type uh timeline so we had to kind of uh, do some things in the dark if you will from them and they loved it they loved it they loved it and then the senior vp came in and went uh i don't really love it i'd like you to change this to this and this to this and this to this and you know my clients came back and said look um we have like two days before this is supposed to go can you do it and I said, guys, it's not better. Yeah. You know, guys, it's going to cost you twice as much now. We know. <laughs> guys, we really don't want to do it. We know. We'll do it for you. The best the is if, the if, day, if that bombs, it's that VP who's getting the, his head's going to roll, you know? That's right. That's right. And it, but, and when it's their company and their brand and their, their neck on the line, they do get to be the final arbiter. And I have certainly had projects where I think I've made it worse by taking that feedback. And maybe eight times out of 10, it has definitely been worse and performed worse. A couple of times it hasn't. You know, we're, again, I'm not the word of God. Um, but most of the time, it's your duty to push back. If yeah. you know the space, the audience, the whatever better, it, it they're paying you for your opinion. I love that. And I'm happy you shared that. I'm going to clip this part into like a little short video because I feel like you and I have worked in that world where you're pushing back. A lot of people who get into copywriting who have never had that, you know, corporate big marketing or tech company experience don't, they don't know you can do that. And I think that, um, I think you really, you really hit it good. It, like you hit the nail on the head because in some cases, especially in like discovery, maybe early stages you should push back but ultimately like you said when it's their neck on the line and you've delivered something and they don't want to get behind it as long as you set the stage that they're gonna to have to pay for these changes and you're not out of pocket you do what they want oh, they just might not 100%. be a, they just might not be a testimonial you use because it bombed because they don't know what they're talking about yeah look uh so there's two things for that one is that if if there's a i'm sure we could have i could have been more succinct and we could click this better but the thing that the rule that I have is I will tell you three times that I think you're wrong and then I'll do what you want. It's a good little and internal every, rule. Every marketing person uh, should should live by that ethos. Hmm. Um, but the other thing you hit on, which certainly I made the mistake of early in my career and I do not make the mistake now, which is you're paying me for X. If X changes to Y, you're paying more. Or you're paying Sco different. Scope creep. The bane of everyone's existence, not just copywriters. Yeah, of course, right? And look, I, I don't think you have to be super anal about it, right? Like when I was on Fiverr, everything was by word count. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to charge you $500 for 500 words, let's say. If it's 510, if it's 550, even if it's 600, I don't care. I want you to be happy and I want you to, to be successful. And if I needed more words to tell the story, then you're going to get some extra. Yeah. But that there's a very fine line and there and the creep happens way faster than you than you uh than you'd uh expect i guess and you smart customers will sneak it by you too of course and it's yeah. i i've never i have some some friends that i talk to on a regular basis and they're constantly you know screw this client and this this client's pushing this deadline and this client's that's their prerogative yeah. Their job, your job is to get as much money as possible. Their job is to spend as little money as possible. Yeah. And for somewhere for you to, you know, meet in that middle. So if a client calls me and tries to push a little bit, uh, I'm not angry. I'm going to try and talk them out of it. Or I'm going to try and, and say, look, uh, no problem, but you're getting a bill. 
Yeah. Uh, but I, why would you get mad at that? I, we've all been on that other side of trying to buy something. You want the best yeah. deal. You want yeah. the best price. Right? So uh, but yeah, set, set those terms. Anybody oh. that's listening, set your terms clearly. And when they deviate, raise your hand and go, things have changed. And don't do free work. Like, like, like Carrie said, if it's like a little extra just to get the point across, it's fine. But don't let people run you over and redo things from scratch if they change the scope. No, 100%. Although, I know you got questions. I'm sorry. But, no, 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 no. Uh, I have a very maybe different, maybe uh, inflammatory point of view on free work in general, which is at the beginning, do all the fucking free work you can find. Oh, yeah, of course. At the beginning of your career, not the beginning of a project. No, no, beginning of your career. Yeah, yeah, okay. Just had to clarify that, guys. I mean, if you want, I I, I constantly, so I'm on like the copywriting subreddit, or I'm on in some discourse. And the the question that is every single day is how do I get my first client? And I'm almost going to set it up in my uh, text expander as just a autofill, which is this is this is not hard. Pick five companies, whether they're in your city or in your country or that you love, go and look at their website, go and sign up for their email newsletters, go look at a bunch of their ads and rewrite them all and send them and say, I love you uh, or I love your brand. I'm starting my career. I think that these are better and here's why. They're yours. Take them. And if I can do anything else for you, here's here's how to get a hold of me and here's how much I, I would charge you. And you're not that. charging very much at the beginning. I love it. How yeah. is this difficult? But but again, to your point earlier, people don't want to put in the work and put in the time. But it's really not that hard. Especially with the internet. Personally. It's so easy. Yeah. You go to their website. I used to do sales calls right to show up to a random office park and like, you know, like a traveling yeah. whatever sale, printer salesman type thing. You know what I mean? Every single copywriting job on LinkedIn that, that I think most people at the beginning would look at and go, well, I don't, I'm not qualified for that. And I don't match that up. Screw it. Write something for that company. Send it to the hiring manager. Send it to the marketing manager. Send it to whatever. And just say, look, I'm at the beginning. I don't meet the qualifications. But look, I have it's, drive. I'm not terrible. Can we do it, it works. It to- so I have a story. A friend of mine I used to work with at Salesforce. And if I... If he watches this and I butcher the story a little bit, I'm sorry. But basically, he was trying to get a job at LinkedIn, right? Another pretty big tech company at the time. This was, I think, before Microsoft bought them. It was a big job. Um, it was like an account executive job managing certain key accounts. And what, this is a little more extreme. He actually went and got a target client, like another named big account, to agree to a meeting with a sales rep at LinkedIn before he was hired at LinkedIn. Love it. Love People were a little bit like, dude, like you can't do that. But he did it. It was free work. They took the meeting. Did they get hot? Did they get the client? I don't know. But he did free work. It probably took him three, four hours to like navigate around to find who to talk to and connect with people. But it works. And imagine how much e- how much easier it would be for a lower barrier to entry thing like copywriting versus hiring someone for a multiple hundreds of thousands of dollar per year job. You know what I mean? Do what Kerry said. Find five companies, even local businesses, like local businesses, you could probably bang out volume of this, like find like 40 small boot camps in your fitness boot camps in your area or, you know, 50 associations or whatever that that are doing marketing and just do it a little bit better than what they're doing. Say, here, this is yours to use for free. If it works and you want to do more of this moving forward, I'm for hire, you know, like it's not rocket science. It really is not. Um, Kerry, yeah, before we go deeper into this, I got to ask you. Go. So you mentioned a moment ago, Fiverr, dollar per word. Is that how you yeah. charge for most of your projects? Or now that you're more referral, how do you typically bill? Because I'm assuming these are much bigger projects than what you were getting on Fiverr. Um, no, not always. A lot, a lot of the work I do is exactly the same kind of work I was doing on Fiverr. Okay. Uh, just direct and without you know paying them their exorbitant fees. Mm. Um, th- there is a difference, though. You know, and you, you listen. You were the big uh, encourager of this in the beginning. Fiverr was how I got 
clients at volume without a large portfolio and had money coming in the door for writing words. Those first few months, uh, I mean, I did a lot. I, for whatever reason, my I had two gigs that blew up. And I did a lot of projects, a lot of small projects. It was, like was, one, was one of them like a marketing email or sales email gig? What, what, what were you doing at the time? No, I had two. One was just my, I said, I'll write sales copy for you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, what's the thing on my little uh, placard there? I'll help you sell like lemonade on a hot day kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just general sales copy. So it was sometimes emails, but it was primarily landing pages. I wrote a lot of landing mm-hmm. pages. Okay. And then the the other one was uh was uh like positioning and mission work, telling the why of what your company is doing, not mm. the the sales messaging. Those are my those are, to this day are my two biggest ones by far. I've done awesome. hundreds of of those. So, and I still like I have three mission projects going on right now. Cool. Uh, and I write lots of landing pages and I write lots of emails. I love writing emails now. But I didn't get a lot of emails from like a lot of email projects from Fiverr. Mm. That's um, like my that's my biggest gig on Fiverr. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. I've, I've heard you say that in uh, in videos. So there's a difference uh, n- now. I bill now by value. Repeat that. I I bill by value. Explain. So I I write really fast. So I, I did a mission thing last week uh, in between research and writing, and I knew this space pretty well. I, it didn't take me 40 minutes. Mm-hmm. And I charged a few thousand dollars for that. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't go back to the client and go, hey, look what I did in 40 minutes, because I think that's a little bit insulting. But yeah. my the value of who I'm working or the, the measure of who I'm working for and what I believe the value of what I'm writing is is how I, and it, it's a bit of a guesstimate. I don't have a, like an exact formula, sure. but I look at something and I look at, you know, what it's, what the targets are for. Cause I always want to talk about how we're going to measure success with my clients. But if I, you know, if I'm writing a, an email newsletter, a sales letter, and we have a $20,000 sales target attached to that, I'm not charging you $200 for that. No, I'm going to charge you $2,000 for that. Right. The value of what I can generate and the value of my experience, obviously, match together, equate to what I'm going to charge you for the work. Now, I, I have some some baselines, right? Uh, I, I don't do a, 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 an investor deck for less than, you know, $1,500 to start, right? Well, that, Even that, that, that makes deck. sense, right? Because what are they trying to do? Raise a ton of money, right? You're not going to do it for 10 bucks. Right? No. Um, but that, that was the big difference on Fiverr. It was quite literally, I'll write 300 words for 500 bucks or 600 words for 800 bucks or a thousand bucks. And no matter what it is, no matter what the space is, if it fits inside those buckets, you can have all of that for, for, uh, for that price. And I think for a lot, for some of the clients on there, you know, I, I know they didn't have big budgets. And so a couple hundred dollars was probably not fabulous. But for a lot of clients I worked with on there, especially on the Fiverr Pro side, uh, oh, 500 bucks, I have no problem. We don't care. Yeah. So, yeah. Right? But but Fiverr was about volume. It was about getting re- reps in. It was about convincing myself that I call myself a writer, which I did not do for at least six months of doing that. And I only just like three weeks ago put that on LinkedIn. <laughs> I hate LinkedIn also, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, so So again, the goals are different. Now that I'm, I'm convinced that I'm doing it well, and I'm offering value, and I can, I can use the 25 years of experience I have in marketing and technology, you're going to pay by value. If you don't want to, if you can't afford it, I get it. Uh, if you don't want to work with me, no problem. I'm not going to take offense, but this is what you're going to pay. Uh, and there's no, the only thing I'm harsh on is there's no sob story. Oh, yeah. well, you know, we, if we could just do it for like 40% less, we could. That's great. I'm sorry. I'll happily introduce you to some people. Yeah. Right. Oh, uh, then the other trap, which, you know, I have gotten burned by in the past, which is, well, if we do one at cheap, we'll do 10 more later. Or if we do this one big project, we'll do <laughs> that, five more after. That's a trap. No. No, I'm sorry. Again, I'm not taking offense. I'm not mad at you, but uh, the rate is the rate is the rate. Yeah. Now, 
if you have if you want to buy 10 up front oh i'll totally give you a break sure but, but you got to pay up front yeah i'm on retainer now yeah, yeah. yeah. And, which I, is another just another quick note for your people um i get paid before i write a word always yeah that's a good point too you, you don't want even and this is especially important off of fiverr where you know fiverr holds the money in escrow mm -hmm. when you're getting hired to do something like writing where once you're done your time is already spent you don't want to leave it to a situation where a they can pretend they're not happy or maybe they're not actually happy and they don't want to pay you or they just have a corporate policy where they take 90 days to pay a bill or an invoice you don't want to be in that situation because then now you're not a copywriter, you're a copywriter and accounts receivable team chasing people around. That is a headache and that'll ruin your life. It will, it'll absolutely, or, or it'll ruin your credit or it'll ruin your ability to pay rent. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, I had, I had clients in, in one of the little agencies I ran in Toronto, you know, we had large, large corporate clients and they would take 90, 120 days to pay and I'd be dipping into my cash to make payroll. Yeah. Right? It sucks. And, and, and it sucks so when you're a one person sucks. show <laughs> because it, you're, you are payroll and the CEO yeah. and the person getting paid. It's different. We were at a scale back then where, yeah, we had some, some times where we ran into trouble, but the, the volume that came in when it came in was so high that we could make it work. Yeah. For me, there is no, again, pardon my language. There's no fucking around with my livelihood. If I can't pay my rent, if I can't buy food, then I don't, you know, my, my life is, affected in a way that i'm not willing to to compromise i do get some people that say look we can't pay you before you do the work and i say i understand completely but again this is there's no ifs ands or buts about this right Fair. i'm not taking so much money from you that if i and i have a track record and i've got lots of clients you could talk to if you really want to but i'm not taking so much money from you that i'm going to cripple your organization if i take your two grand and go to bermuda and don't do the work yeah, exactly. Right. Cool. It, it's just not right. And it, look, if it's maybe if it's somebody I've worked with and it's like a we're doing ten thousand dollars worth of work. Okay, sure, kick me five grand and you can kick me five grand at the end. But I know you. We yeah. have a track record, and yeah. it's enough that you know maybe you just don't. Especially if you're a founder, you don't want to write that on day one. I get it. Yeah. But if nine times out of ten, everything's out of ten today. But nine times out of ten, take the money up front, do the work. Good advice. Good be advice. honorable. Be, be honorable. Be decent. Uh, Carrie, so got a couple more minutes. I got to stop at 12 yeah. here. But one question. If This is kind of for the thumbnail. What was your biggest month revenue-wise as a copywriter? If you if you care to share. Um, oh, God. Like about 26 thousand us 26 thousand us dollars and how long after you started this happen uh that's a good question I, I after about six months i think i was really um and again i did this all day every day so this is not but uh at, at the beginning i think it was about that i, I think I would say my biggest and best month has been, so I, I, I sort of, as a freelancer, it's easy to work all the time. I don't work that hard, let's be clear. But it's easy to work all the time or to just sit down at the laptop for a couple hours in the evening. So I, for, for the last six months of last year, I tracked my time meticulously. Okay. And the better thing for me is that I was able to keep it between 10 and 20,000 a month with not working more than 20 hours a week. That's amazing. Of writing, of, of dedicated writing. Now I'm still doing other things. and I'm That doesn't include I'm finding clients, negotiating, all no, that stuff. Uh, or any of the billing or, or some, uh, you know, uh, learning time or any of that. I write, I get up every morning and I write from usually six, sometimes seven till 11. Okay. Every morning I write, you know, it's three, four hours, five hours kind of thing. Um, and that's my focused, productive, most capable time of the day. I cannot write in the afternoon that well. I can write in the evening again, but during the, the middle of the day, I'm so I do my uh, admin stuff or learning stuff or some other random stuff. There. Uh, my better thing for me is that I kept it between ten and twenty by averaging about twenty hours a week. That's and amazing. that's in me. That's my dream. I don't need to make tons and tons of money. 
Uh, I don't, I'm never going to have another job, like a full-time job. My life now is predicated on the, on the, on the sort of master belief that freedom is my number one thing. If my family needs me, if my friends need me, if I want to go somewhere, I, I need, not even want, I need the ability to do that. I love it. So everything that I'm doing now is focused on lessening my hours, uh, having to equate to dollars. If I have to work to make a dollar, I want to launch some products. I want to launch some other things in that sort of space, but it's the freedom. So the majority of my clients know that, Hey, look, like if we have a deadline, we meet it, but otherwise they'll call and say, look, we're trying to do this thing. Uh, you know, us, can you just, you know, craft this email campaign? And I, I, and I, I don't like let it sit there for weeks, but if I've got some place to go, right. If I'm leaving on a long weekend, I go on the long weekend. Amazing. The work gets done after. Amazing. Now, I, I now feel look, like that's the mindset that, people should chase too. Like you can work tirelessly every day, 15 hours a day if you wanted to, but then what's the point of quitting your job to do something like this? Yeah, hundred percent. And look, I've worked for 25 years to get to this point. And I worked hundred hour weeks for almost the entirety of my thirties, certainly a lot of my twenties. I burned it at both ends and it's not healthy. It's not sustainable. It's not the way to do it. I like working, right? I, I, you know, if if I'm doing client work for whatever it is, 20, let's call it 20 hours a week, I'm still working a lot those other hours. Again, learning things, building things, I'm fascinated with automation uh, and um, uh, getting things done through uh, some, some other no code platforms and through GPT. I'm obsessed right now with SEO. So I'm spending every waking moment watching YouTube videos and trying new things. Uh, I put the time in, but I don't have to put the time in. And I, mm-hmm. and listen, uh, anybody who's just listened to that, if you think I'm an arrogant prick, I kind of am, <laughs> but, but I also, I know that I am lucky. I am blessed to be in this position where people give me enough money doing something I really enjoy now. I, I love, love writing words. I love sitting down and writing words, even though I bleed to do it. Like Hemingway says, um, and it doesn't always flow, right? It doesn't always come, come naturally, but I really enjoy doing it. Um, but I, I just have different priorities. I'm 47 years old. You know, I've lived a life. Um, I have different priorities now and the freedom and the, the ability to do the things that I want to do are far more important than, than almost anything. Else. I love that. That That's the path I'm on. I'm, I'm 33, but I'm on that path. Just a young I, buck. I, I just need to make what I need to make to be able to do the health, the things that keep me physically and mentally healthy. I want to be there for friends, family. That's why I do this whole YouTube copywriting thing. It's once you realize that that's important, like Carrie's saying, like the guy's living in paradise in Mexico, never has to struggle well, through Canadian winter again. But yeah, I mean, hold on though. Like, let's. I, I've designed a life that makes that easier as well. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, I, I mean, uh, we said it earlier before we started recording, you know, I live in Mexico City. It's 25 degrees here, uh, Celsius, 365 days of the year. The weather is almost yeah, exactly right. the same every single day. So, yeah, is it paradise? Is it warm? Is it lovely? Yeah. But I also live in a place where I, and I was just had a long conversation yesterday with somebody about this. I live in a place where it's about a fifth to a tenth as expensive as living in Canada. True. True. I, b- I bought a condo here for a price that I couldn't, you couldn't sniff at in any Canadian <laughs> city. Right? Yeah, tell me I about go it, to, man. I go to my favorite little uh, taqueria and eat as many tacos as I can. It's like five bucks. Right? Yeah. So all those other things become way more accessible when I'm not spending $3,500 a month in rent. Like yeah. I did in Toronto. Or right? more. It's w- Or more. Yeah. Right? It's, you know, I'm not going to Loblaws and spending $200 on like two bags of groceries. I go to my <laughs> local market and for $10, I get as many fruits and vegetables as I can carry. So uh, yeah. the other thing, and I know this isn't, this isn't as easy or as accessible, but if you're trying to design a better life, 
or trying to change the, the course of your life, like becoming a copywriter when you're stuck in a, in a full-time job. If you have the ability, if you work remote, don't fucking live in Canada. <laughs> don't live in the US. Don't live in the UK. Don't yeah. live in even in the Netherlands where my brother and his wife live, where it's certainly not as expensive as those first three, but it ain't cheap. Yeah. There are there are ways that you can go and you could disappear to Mexico for six months or a year and change the course of your life and change the size of your bank account without having to make, you know, like if you make fifty or sixty thousand dollars, I don't understand how you live in those cities. You can't. Don't. You can't live in Toronto or Vancouver on fifty k. But I know well, people you could, but you'd be you'd be you'd be rough in it. Yeah, I mean, you're living in a in a shared apartment, and you know, God knows where, and things like that. And and I'm not judging that. If if you're okay with that, that's great. But if you want to fundamentally change things, I would encourage you to go to some place where you can do that. You know, I don't want to go to Bali. I don't. Funny enough. I live here. I don't like the heat. When it's too hot, I'm really uncomfortable. Right? <laughs> so 25 degrees here is great. Bali, where it's 42 and, and muggy as hell, I'm not going to live there. No. But you can yeah. live in Bali for $500 a month. Yeah. And have a pretty right? sweet life over there. I've been to Bali. It's beautiful. I have an unbelievable life, right? Yeah. My friends were just checking out um, Medellin in Colombia oh, yeah. as a place oh, yeah. to go live. $1,000 a month there? You live like a king. Yeah. Great up, yeah. Dude, okay. I love that you went into that. That was going to be my last question. Where would you recommend people people live if they want to do this for real and try to experience the whole nomad thing as well? But you you kind of I, I don't even you know what I, I don't even know that it has to be a nomad thing because uh, you know again maybe that's not accessible for some people. We've been talking about it repeatedly during this. How much are you willing to sacrifice for a period of time to make the rest of your life better? Right. Do, do, you, do I want to go live with my dad? Nope. If I decided tomorrow that I wanted to be a, uh, I don't even know, pick a profession, just something different than what I do now, would I, would I go live with him for one year in his basement so that I could remove most of my expenses to become that? Because I've got, you know, maybe 40 years left on this planet. Yeah. What the hell do I, what is one year? Yeah. Right. Uh, again, like I love my dad, but I don't want to go live in his basement. But I think if you if you look at things in a more practical way, and are willing to say, okay, I you know I I have this life, I have the things that I like, I have the ability to go and do you know a couple of other things, but overall it doesn't make me happy. Then then do the things that make it possible to change. So live in the parents' bedroom or ba uh, basement. Go move to Medellin. Move to Mexico. Uh, live in a van. Like Van just life, figure yeah. out a way to make it uh, to make it simpler and to make it easier on you. I love it, and I think that's a perfect right. way to cap this off. That'd be a nice a nice motivating short. I'm going to clip out of this as well. But um, I'm going to get Carrie, so much hate. No, Carrie, man, I uh, I love that we did this. I wish we did this sooner. I've had Carrie and I keep in touch. You know, every couple of months, he's an amazing dude, and uh, I've wanted to kind of have you share your story for a while because you're you're inspiring to me, man. I love I love seeing what you're yeah. doing. I was in Mexico earlier this year. I wanted to come visit you, but I was in a guy's trip and it got a little hectic, and we we're too drunk all <laughs> the time. <laughs> but um, yeah. yeah, no, thank you so much, Carrie. Um, I'll probably bug you to be on the channel again in the future if you're down. Maybe you'll be in a different city, but sounds like you're loving Mexico. Oh, listen, it is it is like heaven here. And listen, like I told you, I like to talk, so we can do this anytime. And besides, this was supposed to be 30 minutes. Our, <laughs> did we do an hour? Yeah. Uh, we have to plot out our 365-day uh, course for people. Yes. $100 we, we, in a year. I, I'm down to do that with you. If you're, if you're willing to kind of take the initiative and remind me that we need to meet and talk about it, I'll, I'll for sure be down to help with that. All right. Done and done. Cool. Well, Carrie. Peace, man. And everyone else, thank you for watching. Cheers. Ciao, buddy.